it's fine that we're contradictory. It's fine that we contain multitudes. That's what it is to be human, right? Mm. If I contradict myself, yeah, so I contradict myself. That's okay. I always am sort of uh, stunned by politicians who mm -hmm. get confronted with evidence that they've changed their mind about something and react offensively. I'm like, isn't that good? Isn't that growth to change your mind about something? To say, hey, I have new facts and I took in new information and now I have a different opinion than I did. But because to your point, that feels like an ego threat, people react in this very defensive way because it threatens mm -hmm. one of those very basic, you know, sort mm -hmm. of core ideas of how we see ourselves. On Seekers Mind Talks today, our guest is Matt Ballard a behavioral scientist known for his knack of solving real world problems. He has served as the director of behavioral science at Microsoft and has written the bestseller, Start at the End. On our conversation today, we delved into a lot of topics, including flow state, cognitive biases, mass manipulation using modern day media, personality types, how the mind works and much more. Talking with him made me realize the depths of human cognition and how we can better understand our minds for improving our thinking. I'm your host Raj and enjoy the conversation with Matt on The Seeker's Mind Talks. That was how I wanted to start the show. Uh, I wanted to ask whether you guys are like mind hackers. Um, what I would say is we are no more mind. I, I think the right way to think about behavioral science is to think of it as an evolution of existing processes. So, you know, I have an eight year old. He's trying to change my behavior all the time. He's trying to get me to let him stay up later or play soccer with him or whatever behavior he wants. Right now, what's different about applied behavioral science and what my eight year old is doing is he's not always conscious of the behavior that he wants, right? So he doesn't always articulate it as dad will be doing this when I'm successful. So he's not always formalized about the behavior, right? Sometimes he thinks of it as an emotion or a cognition. I want dad to be happy, right? Not, I want dad to do a thing. So that's, there's that behavioral focus. And then the other piece of science, right? He's not sciencing his way to dad playing soccer, right? He doesn't have a formal process of experimentation, which is a hallmark of science. He's not evaluating why dad is or isn't playing soccer. He's just trying to make it happen, right? And so when he was a little tiny baby, he cried, figured out that got me to came in, you know, cried some more, right? That, you know, he learned that sort of behavioral trick, but he didn't understand why that was occurring. Now, because he's my eight-year-old, I've taught him a lot of that. So he's not kind of use that, right? He will think about, you know, skim you know he'll say man dad i really want you to play soccer i'll say okay well what do you think the promoting pressures are like why would i do that what are the inhibiting pressures right and he can recognize those so he'll say you know i know you love me and you want to play soccer with me but like i also know that you're probably busy with work right now and i'm like cool so do you think you might be more successful if you ask me in a half an hour after i'm off this call after i'm done with this meeting after i'm done with this thing or it's after my work hours He's like, yeah. I'm like, great. So why don't you put that into practice? Come back in a half an hour and with me, right? So he's learning the, the process of science. So mm. are we mind hackers? Maybe, right? But, but not any more than Raj is. All we're doing is being explicit about the outcome that we want, which makes for better ethics, right? The more explicit we can be, the less wasteful we are, and the more we can do things in, in people's aligned interests because it's transparent. And... We're more formalized. We're using a formal scientific method. And the great thing about formal methods is that you can iterate on them. You can improve. So as you said, behavioral science is a young discipline. We keep getting better at it, right? And the better and better we get at it, the more we can teach it to other people as a method and a process that, that we can then use to improve globally for everybody. So if it is mind hacking, it's not mind hacking in secret, right? <laughs> that, that I will keep to myself. It's mind hacking in public, that I will teach to everybody else that then you'll be able to do and everyone else will be able to do. Hopefully, but if this goes to the wrong hands, it is disaster, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I talk often about this as I teach behavioral science is, you know, unfortunately, science as a methodology has been used for great evil throughout time. And that's behavioral sciences like ours. It's also biology and chemistry and physics and all sorts of things, right? Like, you know, we, we get <laughs> we get to bombs, you know, uh, we get to the, to nuclear weapons through physics, right? Um, 
That said, I think there are things that we can do to create processes that make it more likely that it will be used for good than for ill, right? Mm -hmm. So I teach science as a debiasing process. The point of science is to remove bias. If you, Raj, were perfectly, if you had, if you were omniscient, so you knew everything, and you were unbiased, and you accurately perceived everything, you wouldn't need science because you just know. We are not omniscient, and we have lots of biases, so we have to use formal processes that combat those biases. Let me give you a really easy example. Okay. We know from my lab that if I say, Raj, get people to eat more M&Ms, you will gravitate towards promoting pressures, right? Things that make that more likely by, you know, sort of increasing promoting pressure. But in reality, if I want to get you to eat more M&Ms, the easiest way to do that is just put a bowl of M&Ms in front of you. They have lots of intrinsic properties. They're good. They're beautiful. They're caloric. They're all these things. And if I just remove the inhibiting pressure that is availability, you are dramatically more likely to engage with that. Right. We have a similar bias in the opposite direction. If I say, Raj, get people to stop smoking, you probably gravitate towards, well, we'll put giant warning labels on them that will tell you that they make you sick and we'll put high taxes on them so that they're really expensive. And we'll make it so you have to go behind the counter to get them. You have to be over 18, right? You can't just buy them out of a vending machine like you could when I was a kid. Um, but in reality, so we gravitate towards those inhibiting pressures. In reality, what works is banning advertising, right? So when we ban advertising, when I was a kid, you drove down the highway, every billboard was Joe Camel, the Marlboro Man, Virginia Slims, all of these sorts of things. Now we don't have that because we banned it, right? So we have this bias that when we say more of something, we think about promoting pressure. When we say less of something, we think about inhibiting pressures. So what we need is a scientific process, like applied behavioral science, that helps us move past those biases. And so that's where, you know, formalization helps us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So do you mean that the end point of behavioral sciences being omniscient like God? <laughs> no, uh, I mean, I think... In a perfect that, world. Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, that, but that's impossible, right? Yeah. Instead, it's... No, is it that direction? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, so, so... I would say that academics would care more about pure omniscient. Right. Mm -hmm. In that the point of academic. So we talk about applied behavioral science, applied mm -hmm. as opposed to academic. The, the currency of academia is certainty. Right. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Like Raj is going to study some phenomenon and he's going to define it as rightly as he can. So that when Matt builds, you know, does another study, he can set his brick on top of it. We create this, you know, solid wall of knowledge where everything is interconnected and it fits with what we know. And, and there's a high degree of certainty in applied behavioral science. My job is to change your behavior. Right. That's the goal. The goal is behavior change. Now, it turns out that knowing helps me do that, but it's not knowing as an independent good. Knowledge as an independent good is a very academic concept. Right. Gnosticism is a very academic concept. As applied people, behavior is the currency. The ability to change behavior is the currency. It just turns out knowing makes us a lot better at doing that. So the reason that we want to know is not knowing for knowing's sake. It's knowing because it creates some outcome that we care about. This is really important because we often very much privilege knowing as if it were behavior. So for a long time, for example, when we think about nutrition, people spend a lot of time teaching nutrition. Well, if people just knew what was good for them, they'd do it. Obviously, that's not true, right? I know that, you know, chips aren't that great for me and French fries aren't that great for me. I still eat them, right? So knowing is not doing. And so pure omniscience probably, you know, if, if I could choose as a behavioral scientist, I care more about omnipotence, right? The ability to do anything than I care about omniscience, the ability to know anything. Uh, physically speaking in the brain, is it just kind of tackling our monkey mind or our primitive brain or understanding the unconscious responses or the reactionary mechanisms of the brain? So it's, so, there's, in behavioral science, there's always the sort of conversation about theory versus reality. So mm -hmm. in theory, right, uh, we could perfectly understand the human brain and all of the inputs into the human brain, and then we could change behavior by changing the, the brain directly and understanding all of those directly. The reality is life is very complicated, and situations and environments are very complicated. And so there are lots of things, for example, that when you control as many variables as you can, 
in a lab, you can see. But the moment you take them out in the real world, where it's messy and there are lots of variables and they're all moving at the same time, it's just not powerful enough for us to detect. And so, you know, as brain science gets better, yes, we probably will get better at changing behavior, but probably brain science is not going to be the way that we make significant advancements in the short term because the world is extraordinarily complex. And because the world is extraordinarily complex, it is knowable, but unknown. And because there are a sufficient number of unknowns, we have to treat it as if it is unknowable in some ways. So uh, is it just the emotional brain that you're trying to understand? No, not at all. I mean, ideally, you know, all of, our, all of the ways we're about to talk about this, like unconscious, non-conscious, et cetera, are human abstractions of these things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, it, the, one of the things that have given rise to applied behavioral science as a discipline is the study of the non-conscious, right? I'm not going to call it the unconscious. We'll call it the non-conscious, right? Hmm. Which in psychology we see is slightly distinct. Oh, what's you know, the difference there? Unconscious and non-conscious. Unconscious versus non-conscious? Yeah. So uh, unconscious are often things that we have no access to. Non-conscious mm -hmm. is... Uh, we are capable of being aware of, but are not aware of in the moment, if that makes okay. sense. Okay. Right? Okay. So, 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 it's, it, so it has the possibility of being tangible. Yeah, it's impossible being tangible, but that doesn't mean we've okay. made it in a, in a way that we are aware of. So the difference, okay. the difference between consciousness and non-consciousness is more about awareness. Right. Right. Than it is anything else. Yeah. So, uh, so if you take the field of JDM, judgment, decision-making, you know, we can show, for example, that, you know, if Raj, Raj needs a new apartment. So Raj goes around with a little checklist and he goes into apartments and he like checks off thing A and thing B and he like, you know, has his checklist of if it's a six on this attribute, a four on this attribute, whatever, right? Matt's going to get an apartment and instead he's just going to come in and he's going to experience the apartment. So he's just going to stand in the middle of the apartment for 10 minutes or so and feel what it feels like to be in the apartment. And it turns out if we ask you 30 days, you know, you then get an apartment. And we compare how satisfied is Raj with his apartment than Matt with his apartment. It turns out Matt's actually a lot more satisfied with his apartment than Raj is. We are much better non-consciously at taking in all of those variables and figuring out how they're actually going to play out for us than we are necessarily with, with a, what we call Mout multi-attribute utility theory. Like it's a six on this and a four on this and a three on that. Mount style judgments actually don't generally make better decisions than just experiencing the thing. Mm. And so I don't actually think, to your point, that just understanding all of the brain science is like going to solve it because A, we're probably not technically capable of doing that. And B, it's sufficiently complicated. We have to rely on our evolved ability to take in all of those complexities and figure out how they interact with our actual revealed preferences. Um, rather than our expressed preferences. Is that a distinction mm -hmm. that makes sense? That's interesting because uh, the last episode, I it hasn't go, gone out yet, but uh, I had uh, this scientist called Gerd Gigerenser. You might have heard of yeah, him. I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I brought him on my show and uh, he he's, he's all about heuristics and uh, I talked with him a lot about intuitions, human intuitions and how that came into being and all those sort of stuff. And he says he had this simple heuristics. If you are... Uh, well versed in one topic, then go with your intuitions. Otherwise, uh, not go go the other way. Use your rational mind. Well, it depends a little bit on what it is. So I agree with Gerd, sort of, but it depends on what it is, right? So if we're talking about uh, what we might think of as knowledge based goods, mm -hmm. where expertise is actually the thing that will determine quality then yeah, if they're preference-based goods, right? Um, you have a lovely piece of art behind you. We can have different emotional experiences of that art. So, right. and we know, for example, that people's intuitive decisions about what art they like are actually much better than any expertise-based decisions about what, what, what art people will like, mm -hmm. right? So I agree with Gerd to an extent, but there are subjective domains like art where there's not a theoretical maximum. And for those, intuition also turns out to be pretty good, like apartments, right? There's no one better apartment. And so for preference-based things, intuition tends to be relatively good. 
at least subjectively, you get more joy out of it. That's right. As measured, right. As measured by, you know, if we ask you later, how satisfied are with you think? And the problem is that the method by which you decide influences your eventual satisfaction, mm -hmm. right? So we tend to treat those as independent. Like I decide a thing and then I have a thing and then I am evaluating the thing that I have, but you're actually evaluating the combination of the way that you decided and the thing that you have, mm -hmm. right? Vacations are a great example of this, you know, hedonic pre-consumption before a vacation, I'm actually quite happy with the vacation because I'm still in this place where nothing has gone wrong. I haven't paid for anything, right? And I'm sitting here dreaming about how wonderful this vacation is be. So my happiness and satisfaction level is quite high. And in many ways, it actually declines in and through the vacation because I now experience things that make it less than perfect, right? <laughs> Sometimes dreaming about a thing is better than a thing. This also interacts, you know, to your point, Raj, about brain science, uh, what Gerd said is correct, but we also have personality differences here. So mm -hmm. like maximizers versus satisficers is Barry Schwartz's, you know, sort of famous work, right? There are people who their, their process of decision-making is generally to look at absolutely everything and try and find the best version of them, right? That's a maximizer versus a satisficer who just says, as soon as I find the good enough thing, I'm going with it. So Raj and Matt walk into walk into a restaurant, Raj is a maximizer, Matt's a satisficer. They look at the menu. Matt looks two items down. Two items down is a bacon cheeseburger. He says, that sounds pretty good. He puts the menu down. Raj says, yeah, bacon cheeseburger does sound pretty good, but maybe there's something better. And so he has to look at every single item on the menu and see if it's better than the bacon cheeseburger. Those are really different versions of, of a search pattern. Now, if we ask you later about the cheeseburger, Matt actually enjoys the cheeseburger. We both order, end up ordering the cheeseburger because it's the best thing on the menu. Matt actually enjoys it more than you do because you're haunted by all those other alternatives that you looked at. I, on the other hand, don't care. Like, there might have been better things, but this cheeseburger is pretty damn good. At the same time, we know that on some objective, to your point, non-preference-based system, let's look at jobs. Maximizers get paid more, Right. So maximizers have higher salaries because they wait longer and they're more selective and they choose harder, right? Where satisficers are like, eh, good enough, right? I'm actually more satisfied in my job. You make a lot more money. Mm -hmm. Which one of us has it better? Who knows? That depends on your definition of what better means. And what you want more in life, right? Absolutely. Maybe. Well, yeah. that's where, to your point, Raj, about expertise and Gerd's point about expertise, this is where expertise has interaction. So... The way I always give people this advice is, do you take pleasure in the choosing? So mm. I wear the same clothes every day. Why? Because I take no pleasure in choosing clothes. I'm not an expert about clothes. I don't know anything about it. And I don't particularly care. So in domains in which, so Gerd, Gerd would say, if you have expertise, be a maximizer. If you don't have expertise, be a satisficer. Mm -hmm. You would say it slightly differently, which is if you enjoy the search process, be a maximizer. <laughs> if you don't enjoy the search process, be a satisficer. I don't like thinking about clothes, so I should satisfy. I love thinking about computer parts. I've been building my own computer since I was a kid. I want to know each and every individual component in that computer. I take joy in planning all of those individual decisions. And so the search is now actually pleasurable. Mm. And so rather than I happen to have a lot of expertise about it, but I think expertise here is the misnomer. What I would say is if you take a lot of pleasure in the search, maximize. If you don't take pleasure in the search, satisfice. And probably what's true is, Raj, I bet you you can think of an area in which you take a lot of pleasure in choosing. Maybe you love video games and you love reading the reviews of video games and thinking about it almost more than you love playing the video game, right? You love that process of knowing about the thing. Cool. Maximize all day. Read all the reviews in the world. But don't get sucked into doing that in domains in which you just don't actually care. <laughs> Come to think of it, I think in one level, then we are all satisfiers because Gerd wants to be a scientist. You want to be a behavioral scientist. I love doing podcasts or Obama wants to be the president. He doesn't think more, right? Uh, we all have values that we sort of determine or goals that we wish we want to be in life. So is it, can we call all people satisfiers then at some level? Well, what I would say is we know that there are general personality 
characteristics. So people mm -hmm. who generally tend to maximize do so across a number of domains inappropriately, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and ditto for satisficing, right? Ooh, I've lost focus here. We can mm -hmm. come back to me. <laughs> I'm satisficing about how much you can see. So we do know that it's personality dependent. So Raj, you probably maximize across more domains than not. Matt satisfies across more domains than not. The right strategy or the optimal strategy would be maximizing the areas you take pleasure, satisfying the areas where you do not, right? Mm -hmm. In some version of things. Do everybody, does everybody get there? Probably not. I would argue though, Raj, to your point, if we looked within a person, so if we look between people, it may be true that the most satisfying Raj is is more maximizing than the most maximizing that Matt is, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if we look between people, they may not Venn diagram overlap. But if we look within person, probably Raj, you're right. There are areas in which you are more likely to satisfy than maximize, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would say, relatively speaking, most people can recognize that they have these tendencies more or less in particular places at particular times. I think that, I think that's what, probably true. Yeah, okay. What's up with all these personality types? I've seen this 16 personalities. Uh, uh, I've read this book uh, where he describes, there was this book, I forgot the name, where you describe four, generally four different types of personalities and he de sort of defined it in color. I forgot the book's name. Maybe you've read it. Uh, but is this true? Is there personality types? So the biggest... Uh, journal, the most famous journal, the most prestigious journal in my area of social psychology is JPSP, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. And there have been a lot of movements to drop the P for personality because unfortunately, there's been a very little evidence of stable personality things. Mm -hmm. About the only test we've ever, and there's a variety of ways that we decide whether this is true. There's something called test retest reliability, meaning like if I ask Raj today and I ask Raj six months from now, does he answer the test the same way? If it was truly personality, he should, because it should be relatively mm -hmm. immutable and he should say more or less the same thing. Lots of things don't have good test retest reliability. Um, lots of things don't have, you know, I would argue that a good personality test predicts behavior. So my measure for good personality test is whether it predicts behavior or not. Mm -hmm. That's, the only way I know that if you're truly different is if you're actually doing something different. I can't pop your brain open and see like, ah, oh, yes, there's the, you're a pink banana personality, right? Like I can't do that. So the only thing I can judge is your behavior. Hmm. In terms of personality tests that predict behavior and, and I'm going to say global behavior rather than local behavior, meaning it predicts a wide number of things rather than like some hyper-specific behavior. For that, the best test that we found is something called the Big Five. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty well known and well validated at this point. Yeah. As, you know, conscientiousness and maybe right. the other kind of things. Um, that one has had pretty good behavioral uh, reliability. It show it do does tend to predict a relatively large number of behaviors and expressions about a person. Mm -hmm. There are localized things. My absolute favorite, Raj, myself is. Um, one called the need for cognition, uh, okay. uh, need for cognition scale. So need for cognition, I love this one because a lot of personality tests, it feels like there's a good and a bad, right? Okay. So even the Myers-Briggs, which by the way is a terrible personality test and has very little science, uh, <laughs> you know, people tend to answer in a way that is uh, congruent with how they want to see themselves, right? So it's very much like a mirror. Um, what I love about the need for cognition test is it doesn't have an obviously good or bad answer. So it, it contains items that, for example, everything in my life would be a puzzle if I could, mm -hmm. right? I would like a world in which everything is a puzzle. Um, but I do think that it has tended to predict behavior, um, uh, at least on localized tasks, like how much people seek out sort of challenging problems and those sorts of things, things like TV preferences, right? Mm -hmm. There are, there are more, there's more cognitive versus less cognitive television, um, for example. And so my personal favorite is the need for cognition test. It's a fun one. And it, it will make you think about like, Hey, where do I like spending cognitive attention versus where do I not want my life to be a puzzle? Mm -hmm. Right. Going back to our early question, I do not want my clothes to be a puzzle. 
I hmm. do want my computer parts to be a puzzle. I take pleasure in the solving of the puzzle that is the optimal computer. I take no pleasure in solving the puzzle that is the optimal outfit. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Why? Why? The question I wanted to ask there is like, why do we want to lie to ourselves? Why do we have these cognitive biases? Is it just a survival mechanism? Because you, the, you, you pointed out that when we take that personality test, we kind of answer it in a way that how we want to see, not like as we really are. Yeah. Because if you have to know who you really are, you have to ask the people around you. You see from your own two eyes. And why do we have that? Why do we, what, what's cognitive bias to you guys? Or is it just a protection I, you know, mechanism? The why is very hard, right? You know, people give evolutionary answers to these things. I don't trouble myself too much with, with the why. What does seem to be true is the following. Mm -hmm. It seems to be true that humans have two very basic but somewhat contradictory drives. One of them, I sometimes call this a snowflake in a blizzard problem. Mm -hmm. One is I want to be special and unique. We know that if Raj does not feel like a special and unique person, individual, like, you know, different than the others around him, et cetera, he gets relatively depressed, right? You need to feel special and unique. At the same time, you need to feel connected to other people, right? You need to feel part of a group, like you have peers, that people care about you, that you're connected by something, that you have mutual interests, mutual likes, you know, mutual protection, all these things. So this need for individualism and mutualism seems to be very fundamental to humans. We're not quite sure why. Um, I can give you sort of made up evolutionary reasons, right? So there's some people that would argue evolutionarily we have benefited from mutual protection. So we benefit from communities. We, but then in order to get differentiation, in order to get growth, we need differentiation, right? Raj has to want to be the best blacksmith in the world so that we get better blacksmithing techniques, right? And so one could argue both of these are evolutionary. Do we have evidence for that? Very hard to tell, right? Like evolution, brain evolution, very hard to study that way. But it seems to be true. And if we look at people's identity, there are tons and tons of behaviors in which people are working to, to either honor one or the other of those, whichever seems to be lacking in the moment. So I can frame things in such a way as they support your individuality or support your groupness. And the frame that we, that we hope you take in that moment will determine which one of those you choose. So for example, Hazel Marcus at Stanford has done some really great work on, you know, uh, manipulating uh, choices to bring up a particular frame and changing what people's preferences are. My favorite example of this is, uh, Raj, if I give you a billion dollars right now, but you can only buy a car, what car would you buy? I don't know. I always wanted a Lamborghini Urus. Okay, Lamborghini. What color is your Lamborghini? Is it, what color? Orange. Orange. Like bright orange? Like a burnt orange? What kind of orange are um, Sort of orange, orange, you know. Orange, like orange. A fruit orange. All right, like a fruit orange. An orange, orange. <laughs> Harvin. Fruit orange. It's like not lemon yellow, it's just orange orange. Raj, you buy orange orange. You see me your whole life. You buy your orange orange Lamborghini, you know. Congratulations. Very special day. You're getting the car you've always wanted. You park it outside, of course, because you want to show off your new orange orange Lamborghini. You go home, you know, you have the best night of your life. You're talking to your partner about your orange Lamborghini. You feel good. You come down in the morning, you know, you get your robe, you go out to get the paper, and you happen to live next door to your best friend Matt. And what is parked in Matt's driveway, but an identical orange, orange Lamborghini? Mm. How do you feel? <laughs> I'm not special. That's right. So some portion of the population says I'm pissed, right? Mm. Matt has ripped off my preference and what a bastard and blah, 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 blah. Right. Another portion of the population says, that's so awesome, Matt. And I could start an orange, orange Lamborghini club and we can get our other friends to get orange, orange Lamborghinis. They will cruise around on Friday night with orange, orange Lamborghinis, right? And it turns out that your response in that moment, whether mm -hmm. sort of anger and ego threat, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, hey, it's threatening mm -hmm. my individuality. Mm -hmm. or, oh man, mutualism depends a lot on factors. So for example, we know that for that um, it depends on socioeconomic status. We know that people who are higher SES Mm -hmm. tend to prefer individuating purchases, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. they want things that nobody else has that are different than the people around them, et cetera. We know that people who are lower SES tend mm -hmm. to form, to, tend to prefer, you know, what we think of mutualism purchases, things that bring me closer to other people and bond me as part of a tribe. 
Mm-hmm. So do we know where those forces come from? No. Do we believe that they very powerfully change what we do? Absolutely. Yeah, the thing about that is both are important. You yes. can't say no to either. Do we have other fights going on inside our head like this? I mean, arguably, humans are defined by the fact that we have almost everything fighting all of the time. That we are subject to our contradictory desires. You know, as as um, as the you know the poet said, right? Do I contradict it myself? Therefore. So I contradict myself. Uh, it's fine. I contain, I'm vast. I contain multitudes. That was a terrible bastardization of that, that poetry. I'm clearly not a poet, but like, it's fine that we're contradictory. It's fine that we contain multitudes. That's what it is to be human, right? Mm. If I contradict myself, yeah, so I contradict myself. That's okay. I always am sort of uh, stunned by politicians who mm-hmm. get confronted with evidence that they've changed their mind about something and react defensively. I'm like, isn't that good? Isn't that growth to change your mind about something to say, Hey, I have new facts and I took in new information and now I have a different opinion than I did. But because to your point, that feels like an ego threat. People react in this very defensive way because it threatens Mm -hmm. one of those very basic, you know, sort Mm -hmm. of core ideas of how we see ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Cool. Ah, basically, uh, basically, <laughs> why are you smiling? <laughs> we start talking about humans, and we start the sentence with basically. <laughs> we're like, do it all best here. Right? That's that's what makes it hard. No, no, this is just the start of next question. Basically, uh, as a behavioral scientist, uh, are you guys trying to open the Pandora's box to awareness? Like, basically, are we trying to become more aware? So, so, uh, so first of all, it's important that we say the word applied, right? Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm, 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 certainly mm-hmm. the academic behavioral scientists right, 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 probably right. are trying to understand something about that. Whereas applied behavioral scientists, I answer from the perspective of, well, does it change your behavior or not? So if making you more aware of something is likely to change your behavior, then yeah, I'm all for awareness. If more mm-hmm. awareness is likely to change your behavior in the opposite way of the direction that we want, I actually may want you to be less aware. Aware. Let me give you a great example, public speaking, right? Mm-hmm. Being hyper self-aware of like, oh man, I screwed up that word and I stuttered here and everybody's looking at me. Like all of that awareness may actually interfere with your ability to do your best work and to be your best self, right? You might actually need less awareness in order to be able to do the thing optimally. So there's this sort of belief that the more aware we are, the better we'll always be. But to sort mm-hmm. of go you know, to sort of Gingerizer's point, not always, right? Sometimes our non-conscious is actually much better at these things. And at, you know, elite levels of athleticism, much of that is muscle memory and other, you know, like we we'll always want to be hyper aware of every part of everything that we do. It doesn't always bring out the best performance. Mm-hmm. So what's unique about behavioral science is, you know, rather than sort of saying like, well, here's awareness and let us pivot forward from awareness. It says, here's optimality let's find the optimal point of awareness that re- leads to this optimal behavior, right? It says mm-hmm. the outcome is the thing I care about. Let's find the method that creates that outcome rather than saying, well, awareness is an independent good. Let's go find out like what we can do with awareness. Right. Right? Knowledge can sometimes be a curse. hundred percent, right? It doesn't always, it depends on what behavior you want, but it doesn't always create the behaviors that, that, you know, we often, the, the world is rife with, you know, counterintuitive findings of, you know, we thought knowing would do one thing. And in fact, it did the exact, it's not just that it did nothing. It did the exact opposite thing, right? It generated some, you know, irrelevant behavior or worse behavior that we don't want. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for applied behavioral scientists like me, we always kind of want to be very conscious and thoughtful about, about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I read this, uh, it's called the law of repetition, I think, in which a statement when given out to a sufficient amount of people and repeated n number of times, it becomes a truth. And tying this up with modern day mass media, do you think uh, a population behavior can be swayed around when a certain statement uh, can be repeated n number of times? Yeah, I mean, I think what I would say is I don't just think that. I think we have very strong evidence from science that this is true. It's not about mm-hmm. Matt Waller's opinion. We we know this. So there's something called the mere familiarity effect, mm-hmm. um, which is has to do not so much with with truth and knowledge, but with with 
preference and preference can lead to truth and knowledge, right? If we like something, it can make us feel like it's more true. And we, so they're relatively clever experiments where people flash. So they're abstract doodle shapes. They're not real shapes. They're just like abstract doodles. And I flash those at you at a level of below your awareness. So mm -hmm. if I consciously showed you these, you couldn't say which ones you'd seen and which ones you hadn't seen. You couldn't say, yeah, I just saw a flash of that one, right? They're below your level of awareness. But if I give you a bunch of squiggles and I say, pick the squiggle you like, you'll pick the one that I flashed at you. So if I flash you one a hundred times, and then I say, pick the one that I flat, pick the one you like, you'll pick the one that you are most familiar with. This explains pop music, right? <laughs> you ever have that phenomenon where you hear a song and you're like, this is not a very good song, but then, you know, it kind of catches on and it gets played on the radio 82 million times. And you're like, find yourself kind of humming along to it in the car. You're like, maybe I do like this song, <laughs> right? Why? Mere familiarity. It's just been repeated to you enough times that, that you tend to start to like that thing. Mm -hmm. Can entire populations be manipulated with this? I mean, so you want to think of these as probabilistic science, not deterministic science. So mm -hmm. what I mean is we don't do things and then 100% of people do the same thing all of the time with that. Because as I said, people are complicated, right? And situations are complicated. But yes, on average, the more we can get something to be repeated, the more likely, you know, this is why sound bites work in politics, right? Mm -hmm. Because the more... Mm -hmm and I can get people to clatch onto that salad bite, even when the sound bite is like highly inappropriate and irrelevant and doesn't have anything to do with anything. If I can just get people to repeat it enough times, a great, I'll give you a great recent example of this. If you ask people uh, uh, whether we should, uh, let me find the exact wording for you because I have it because I was just talking about it with somebody here. Hold on. Exact wording. Where's the fun thing? <laughs> Let's see here. I think it was here. Give me one second. Sure, no problem. Take your time. Science. Okay, there we go. So this is uh, from a from a from a study. Percentage of Americans who say that the United States should spend more money on assistance for poor people. Seventy two percent of people agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. If you call it welfare, only twenty nine percent of people do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. So. Welfare, this word that has been repeated so many times, welfare is bad, 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 people react to it a certain way. But if you just use different words to describe exactly the same thing, people's preferences are dramatically different, right? Wow. And so, you know, is that mass manipulation of everybody? I don't know, man. That feels like maybe a strong, uh, a strong thing. You know, there's an element of consciousness here. So, uh, an example I give my my social psychology students at times is um, there's a phenomenon we call the misattribution of arousal. So mm -hmm. the misattribution of arousal is basically if I physiological, physiologically arouse your body and you can't kind of figure out why, your brain looks around and says, well, why is my body all agitated? And then it attracts, attaches it to something. The famous study here is something called the shaky bridge study. Okay. So. You're in a park in Canada, you walk across a bridge, on the other side of the bridge is an attractive person of the opposite gender who uh, has a survey to fill out. And at the end, they give you their number and you can call them to get the results of the survey. And so the measure is, do you call this person? Do you mm -hmm. call this attractive person that you just met? Now, the, the manipulation here is, some people went off of, over a very sturdy bridge. It's two mm -hmm. feet off the ground. It's across a little ravine. It's very sturdy. The other one goes, the other people are going across quite a shaky bridge. It's a little bit unsteady. It's above this high ravine. So there's reasons that your body is agitated. It turns out the people who go over the shaky bridge are more likely to call the experimenter on the other end because they, their brain says, oh man, I'm all like fishnicked. Why am I fishnicked? Oh, I must be attracted to this person. Mm -hmm. This is why spicy food is date food, right? Because... What does spicy food do? It makes you sweat, dilates your, dilates your blood vessels. What else makes you sweat and dilates your blood vessels? Being attracted to somebody, right? Why are scary movies date movies? Same mm -hmm. thing, scary movie. What does it do, right? Agitates your nervous system and you go, man, I must really like this Rush guy because I'm like feeling really frustrated right now. It's really the movie, right? But what I always tell my students is, and people do this unconsciously all the time. We know date movies are date, you know, scary movies are date movies, spicy food is date food. We know this, right? 
Ferris wheel is the place to, you know, kiss your, your, you know, your, your partner, right? We know these things, but we don't know why. Doing them when we don't know why is not unethical, right? Like we're doing something that feels culturally normative. But the moment I tell you about this, Raj, I tell you, here is why eating spicy food is going to make this person attracted to you. Now you can't do it anymore, right? Because now you're manipulating this person. Mm. And the solution to that is transparency. So if I say, Raj, I fancy you, we're going to go get some spicy curry and I'm going to explain this phenomenon and it's going to make you like me more, then it's okay, right? If both of us understand mm -hmm. what's happening and we both have the stated, you kind of like me too. So Raj says, yeah, I like you too. So let's go get some spicy food in honor of our liking of each other and we'll like each other even more, right? <laughs> then, then it becomes okay. So this mm -hmm. is where awareness comes in. This, you know, when you talk about manipulating a population, it depends on the level of awareness of the population that they are, in air quotes, being manipulated, that their behavior is being changed. If mm -hmm. they are aware that their behavior is being changed and the method by which that is being done, it is no longer manipulation. Mm. It's just science, mm. right? I got you. So if I do this in pro-social aims, I'm going to do this to help you uh, exercise more often. We would argue that that is a good pro-social outcome. And I'm telling you, this is what I'm going to do, and here's how it works, and this is why it's going to make you exercise more often. Suddenly, it becomes ethical because of mm. that layer of transparency. And this is why science education is so important, right? This is why applied behavioral scientists exist. If we explain how behavior is created and changed, right, and we communicate that clearly to populations and educate them about how science works, we are better able to make collectively ethical decisions about mm. what you might term as manipulation. Gotcha. I had an anthropologist on my show and um, he explained it, it somewhat the sim is somewhat similar point as to what you said, because our current financial times, the world is going down. Everybody is more or less going more or less into a fight or flight response. And it's like having that spicy food. You are unstable psychologically and you are more susceptible to being quote unquote manipulated. Uh, do, but, do, yeah. But again, is that manipulation, right? Like yeah. <laughs> it depends on the level of transparency. When we call something manipulation, it's about the level of transparency with it, which I am changing behavior. Mm -hmm. So one of the fundamental things about applied behavior, and this is why I like processes, because you mm -hmm. can build in ethical checks. So we could mm -hmm. say, here's the process of applied behavioral science. And here's where we do a check to make sure that the person is aware of what's happening and that it's congruent with their wants, right? Uh, and so there's a whole chapter in my book on ethics and how we do this, but you can build it. That's the beauty of processes is you can build these things in, right? There's a big revolution a few years ago about checklists in medicine and the evidence that even highly skilled people benefit from checklists because it formalizes a process that you then can evolve. You could put a new thing into the checklist and say, oh, here's a new ethical check. Here's a new step that can cause them to do better things. And so one of the benefits of formalizing science, formalizing applied behavioral science, is that we then can iterate it to say, and here are the places where you need to embed ethical checks to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. You you work for Microsoft, Netflix, and all, the, all these giants, uh, I've read. And uh, uh, do they have these sort of guidelines or... They do when I'm working for them. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, we... How, how much is all this, when you tie it up with these big tech giants, how much is what we spoke of applicable to tech giants or, or who has a mass outreach to the people? I mean, I think that it's very applicable, but again, mm -hmm. tech giants are big and you're talking to one person inside of them, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, many times, so, uh, like all big entities, parts of it are working against each other at any given time, right? So somewhere in Facebook is somebody working very, 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 very hard all day, every day to end, uh, you know, pornographic exploitation on Facebook, mm -hmm. right? At the same time, there's someone else making policy decisions that make that actively harder inside of the same organization. Mm -hmm. And often from the outside, what we look at is assume we assume malintent. So we think mm -hmm. that the company consciously makes this policy decision, understanding all of its outcomes, all of its implications, and that there is no one doing the other work. Mm -hmm. In reality, that is almost certainly not true. 
A, companies are way more ignorant. They're making some, they're making a decision based on A and they don't understand B, C, D, E that happened because of it. And there may be two opposing things within the company working on things that are fundamentally oppositional at any given time, mainly because of the way their accountabilities are, are made, right? If you're the person in charge of monetization and pornography is easy to monetize, you're like, cool, more better, right? Okay. Um, you know, if you're over here working on child exploitation, like, and it's not that the monetization person is saying child exploitation, this is great, right? It's unawareness of the implications of the thing that they are doing. Mm. And so a lot of this, we go, I go back to visibility, right? When we are more coordinated in an organization and make our work more visible to each other, it is more likely that someone over here will be able to say, hey, this policy decision that you're making is going to have these knock-on ramifications over here, and we want to do that thoughtfully and consciously. Much of the harm that is done by corporations is done unconsciously, right? Okay. It's a lack of awareness, not a kind of thing. Okay. Uh, are there overarching ethical bodies to corporations? So uh, it depends on the corporation. Mm -hmm. Um you know, legal, unfortunately, is the like sort of normative ethical body, but legal boundaries and ethical boundaries are not actually the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so some obviously, well, yeah, <laughs> right? You can't. It's very hard to legislate morality, right? Like that's not what <laughs> laws exist for. Um, what I would say is, some corporations, particularly in the parts of the corporation that are more academically familiar, do have formalized bodies. So mm -hmm. in academia. Um, we have something called IRB, Institutional Review Boards. Mm -hmm. And so if I wanted to run an experiment as someone inside of a college uh, or university, I would submit what experiment I wanted to run and the rationale and the harms and all of these, just a lot of documentation that goes into this Institutional Review Board, which then reviews all of that and says, well, here are the potential risks, et cetera, right? That's a formalized IRB. And if you're doing a formal study, that level of formalization may be appropriate. At places where I've worked, for example, like at Clover Health, um, we start we created an internal ethical review process, right? Mm -hmm. That was deliberately not run by me because my team was generating the majority of the things that would need to be reviewed, right? The majority of the interventions. It was chaired by our, our chief science officer, um, uh, Kumar, who led that panel. And, you know, there was a separation of church and state. Now, was it as formal as an IRB where I have to fill out a bunch of forms and they explicitly reject something? No, right? Instead, it was an advisory body. I said, here are the things I want to do. They say, hey, here are the things we don't understand. Here are the places where we have some concerns. Here are the places that it seems okay. And then we work together to try and process those. And the test of a good organization is if you never kill anything, mm -hmm. that's a sign that it's not working. So meaning if Raj is my ethical review board, and I submit things to, to Raj, and magically, we still do absolutely everything that I submitted every time. That's a problem, mm -hmm. right? The way that we know that an ethical review board is working is if it modifies my original intent. If I change what I do because, the eth because of advice of the ethical review board, right? And so that's the best measure we measure internally. So we would look at that. We would look at, you know, how, how close to our original proposal is what we finally ended up doing, and that indicated to us whether or not ethical feedback was being taken in. But again, to our earlier point, formalization helps us, right? Knowing we did 100 projects, here's how close they were to the original, there was a process for doing this, allows us to have better insight into, hey, are we moving in a more ethical direction or not? Cool, cool. Okay. Uh, what are emotions for you guys? How do you see emotions? Again, I can't speak for the whole field, and okay. and the majority of our field, by the way, is not guys. Uh, there are more there are more applied behavioral scientists that are not guys than than I those that are sexist, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's, 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 you know, we we are applied behavioral science uh, is dominated by a bunch of very talented women. Uh, so I don't. I think emotions exist. I mm -hmm. think cognitions exist. Mm -hmm. I think things and feel things, and therefore, like they have face validity for me, right? That said, I don't spend much time, I don't think of emotions and cognitions generally as outcomes, mm -hmm. right? Instead, they are interventions or, or pressures that, that behaviors are the outcome. Behaviors are the thing I care about because behavior is the thing I can observe. I have no access, Raj, to your emotions or cognitions. Mm -hmm. No access, except this filtered through your behavior. 
right? You can tell me about them, but telling me is a behavior, right? We have all told people that we were happy when we were very sad. That has happened to absolutely everyone everywhere at some point in their life. They have lied about an emotional state that they were in. And the people around them either knew that was a lie because they perceived some other behavior. You're telling me you're fine, but you're crying, right? Or they didn't, and they went along with the lie because they have no way of knowing. We only can experience people's emotions and cognitions through the filter of behavior. And so I focus very much on the filter of behavior, right? Rather than the filter of emotions or cognitions, which people have to self-report and therefore have all sorts of biases and whether those are cognitive biases or sort of self-presentational biases. So I don't focus a lot on that. I focus a lot on environments because environments are the things that we can change to create behavior. Um, but, you know, um, emotions and cognitions don't play a huge part in the work that I do typically. Okay. Okay, cool. I got you. Right. Because... Ultimately, I want you to do things that make you happy, right? I don't want you to feel the, I don't want you to tell me that you're happy. I want you to do things that you say make you happy. Yeah. This is just a fun quote I had. Like I saw this uh, recent tweet from Elon. He said that. <laughs> <laughs> things, that things that get us in trouble. Yeah, I saw a quote from Elon. Okay, go. <laughs> yeah, I saw this quote from Elon and he said that basically what, parenting is is 18 or 20 years of uh what do you call that um uh, prompt engineering hmm. i mean it's I totally it right. a little bit and it's it sounds funny because <laughs> right. well, it's very clearly like you know there's he's not the only one to make this this mm -hmm. comparison between training and llm mm -hmm. and 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 you know sort of the way that we interact with ai uh here's the here's the reason I would say that isn't particularly true. Mm -hmm. So prompt engineering is actually about how we interact with AI, right? A prompt is a way that we interact with AI. It's much more about environmental engineering, right? Creating the environment in which I have an eight-year-old, right? Yes, I'm trying to influence his behavior, but I'm mostly trying to influence his behavior by creating a set of promoting and inhibiting pressures mm -hmm. that create behavioral patterns. And the difference in child rearing is I only care about a narrow slice of behavior. So I don't care if my son plays soccer, basketball, or football. I don't care, right? That's not a behavior. I don't set out the beginning. Whereas like, if you're the NFL, you want my son to care about football and not soccer and not basketball, but football, right? They care a lot because they're capitalist and they care about that outcome. As a parent, you actually care only about a narrow slice of outcomes, right? And so I'm continually optimizing for those outcomes and letting the rest of them come out as they may. I care that my son does active things because mm -hmm. it's healthy to do active things. But if that's organized sports like football or that's laser tag or that's like taking a walk and talking about nature with his dad, I don't really care. Mm. Right. And so I think Elon cares a lot more. So I, th I would bet that if Elon and I had a discussion he has a larger number of behaviors that he thinks of as adaptive. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a parent, I actually think I'm optimizing for fewer and fewer behaviors. That's my job. And as a matter of fact, better parents optimize for smaller amounts of behaviors, more likely, right? Um, if anything, I, I mostly just argue with myself about like, you don't need to care about that. Stop caring about it. You want to care about it because you have some attachment to it, but that's not what's in service of me. I'm a boxer by, by nature. So that's my sport of choice. So naturally, I would love it if my son loved boxing because I would love us to bond over that thing. But that's not my job. My job is not to get my son to love boxing. My job is to create an environment in which my son finds things to love for himself. Mm -hmm. And so narrowing that down, not trying to control so much of your kid's behavior is probably likely good. Maybe it depends on whether you're a satisfier or a maximizer. That's possibly true. And, and, and I think so you, you joke, but I think that's very true, right? Mm -hmm. I think there are people who are, uh, there's a difference between maximizing your kid and maximizing on behalf of your kid, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it is reasonable to maximize on behalf of your kid. I'm going to try and find the best possible environment that I can for you, right? That's different than maximizing your kid. I'm going to get you to try to do the best possible things. I am not trying to maximize my son. Right? I'm not trying to say, this is what I believe good looks like, and I'm going to try and 
control every element of your life so that you look like my version of good. Instead, I'm trying to say, what is the best circumstance? Can I maximize the outcomes of this circumstance to create optionality for you in the direction of good? Hmm. Right? So it's all about maximization. It's about what are you maximizing? Maximizing the environment? Yeah, absolutely. Do you meditate? No. No? No. As a matter of fact, I am notable. I get a lot of flack for this. Uh, I do very consciously, so not mm -hmm. out of laziness, but very consciously do a set of things that are very different than the sort of Andrew Huberman, Elon Musk, hyper-controlled sort of version of the world. So as an example, I don't keep a to-do to -do list. Why? Because my brain has evolved over millennia to pay attention to particular things because they are important. If I forget to do something, maybe it isn't as important as I thought it was. And my brain's pretty good at sorting that out. So unless I need to consciously intervene, it's incredibly likely that I'm going to forget A and A is in fact very important. Then I'll write a note to myself. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, I try to just let my brain do the things that it's supposed to do in a Gerd Ginger as a sort of way to sort of let those intuitions and, and heuristics work in the way that they should work. But a lot has changed in the past two, three decades. More change has happened in the past three decades okay, because I was reading this and it says that 99.99% of our human history, we've been hunter gatherers and, and that's why we still have this craving for fast food and it's not actually benefiting us, but our natural intuition is to go for that fast food. And that's because the environment has changed drastically, but our brains are telling the opposite. So calorie rich environments are an interesting one. And mm -hmm. I mean, leaving aside whether we were, we were hunter gatherers or not, calorie rich environments are, are to your point, a newer in, you know, in the last hundred ish or so years, calories have only then have calories been abundant. Um, and they're still not abundant for lots of people around the world. So we're talking, first of all, from a very Western, you know, US centric perspective, but yes, calories are now more abundant here. And yeah, you're right. I need to do some things to make sure that I stay healthy and I need to inhibit my desire to eat absolutely everything that comes across my plate. But that change wasn't overnight, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Actually, that change was over very long periods of time. We like used to starve a hell of a lot more. And then over time, it's not like we were like not starving and then start, you know, or sorry, starving and then not starving. Like 1950, all of a sudden we got all the calories we need, right? Instead, actually over time, like food variety has gone up, caloric sort of excess has gone up. And so my brain actually has had time to adapt to that. Do I need to, you know, implement some self-control? Of course, you're picking a great example of a place where, yeah, I have to do a little bit of self-control. But I don't think that is the same thing as I need to control absolutely every aspect. I'm taking a satisfying versus maximizing approach. I am having just enough control to keep me healthy. Mm -hmm. Right. As opposed to I'm going to try and maximize the amount of control that I have over my brain mm -hmm. in order to try and reach some theoretical maximum, which, again, I think Elon would probably think that that's a terrible idea. Right. He has very much ideas about like what perfect looks like and wants to strive for that thing. I have a very different version of the world. So I'm not saying that meditation, by the way, is bad. I think it's great for lots of people. It just doesn't turn out to be very effective for me. Uh, it's much more effective for me to go out in the garage and, and, you know, put on the boxing gloves and, and hit the bag for a while and work out whatever I need to work out that way. And basically it's just being aware of your thoughts, right? Because when you sit there and you see that your mind is the monkey mind, is there something like that? The monkey mind and the other mind, because that's a popular term these days. Yeah. I think that I would look at those less binarily and probably more as a continuum, mm -hmm. right? There are there are things that are relatively more non-conscious versus conscious, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, one could argue meditation is the process of moving or trying to move non-conscious things into the conscious part of my mind, mm -hmm. right? Other people would say it's a stillness of mind. But, you know, it's interesting. I was talking actually to my partner last night about this, you know, because I don't think of my mind as not particularly still. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I don't walk around in a place where I find my mind to be terribly noisy. Um, I find my mind to be a relatively clear place all of the time. And so sitting there trying to make it clearer, as a matter of fact, for me, that's why I like boxing and not yoga. Right. When I do yoga, 
my brain is just like, right? Like it can't stop thinking. The beautiful thing about boxing or surfing or the sports that I prefer is they require your presentness, right? If you lose focus in surfing, you fall off the wave. If you lose focus in boxing, some dude punches you in the face, right? Like they demand your presentness. So certainly when we talk about meditation as mindfulness, meditation as presentness, I enjoy things that keep my mind present right in that moment. But I don't necessarily think if, you know, if presence on this is on this axis and awareness of conscious thought is on this axis, I'm more concerned with presentness than I am about what I'm particularly thinking about. I'm happy to go box and let it be about boxing. When you are surfing, are you in the flow state? So this is an interesting question about people's understanding of what the flow state means. So mm -hmm. one could argue that when I surf and box, what I'm really doing is something similar to sleep, which is to say I'm I am occupying my conscious mind while I allow my non-conscious mind to process whatever it needs to process. So a good example of this is like when you were a kid, you did math problems that were like the Fibonacci series, right? Like it's like one, one, two, three, five, eight, like, and, and, you know, then we give you some blanks and you have to fill it out, right? Obviously we choose something that's more complicated than that. There is a lot of evidence actually that you can work and work and work on this consciously and not solve it and then sleep and be, and wake up with the answer which suggests that your non-conscious mind has been continually processing this, processing this during sleep, recognizing the pattern and then elevating it to your conscious mind. And that that is actually a better strategy than you sitting there for eight hours and trying to figure it out. One could argue that what, rather than meditation, which seems to be about clearing the conscious mind so that it can do the processing, I am instead meditating by boxing and surfing and entering what you might call the flow state so that my non-conscious mind can do its thing. Right. So that I'm not trying to constantly override my non-conscious mind with my conscious mind. Right. Mm. I'm allowing my non-conscious mind, which I definitionally do not have access to, to do the processing that it needs to do so that it has time to come back with the thing. Mm. Is this whole story about your 95% uh, of your brain is unconscious true? I mean, it's very hard for us to measure these things. Mm -hmm. right? um, you know, all of the ways that we sort of say that are are ambiguous. But yeah, I mean, it does generally seem to be true that there is a large amount of non-conscious non processing that is occurring at any given time, mm -hmm. right? And a good example of this is sleep, right? We are definitionally non-conscious during sleep, and yet our brain remains extraordinarily active, right? So that suggests to us that at least you know, some large portion of things are going on, right, that that are not in our conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. So rather than the conscious mind and the non-conscious mind, as if they were two things, I prefer to think of them as like the same thing, right? And it's the only thing that changes is what I have visibility into. And perhaps when I meditate, I can move that focus of visibility so I can see something that I would, that I hadn't previously seen, mm -hmm. potentially. But it's still on the, it's still on the same continent, right? It's on the continent of my mind and all the changes is where on that place I'm focusing my attention at any given thing. And again, like, it's like a, let's say you tap your leg. You're sitting at the table and you have this unconscious habit, non-conscious habit of tapping your leg. And then I bring it to your awareness and then you're aware of it, right? Like, did that move the behavior from one part of the brain to another, right? Or did it shift your focus onto a thing that was already occurring to allow you to interrupt it? Mm. It's funny because all the meditative practices seems to be saying like, uh, just notice you moving your leg. Don't change it. Well, that's what the basics of mindfulness is. I had this incredible story. Like, uh, I think it was said by the Buddha. I don't know where I heard it. It's like um, a fly came and sat on Buddha's nose. And uh, first time, he just watered it away and it flew away. And second time, and his disciple was watching him. And the second time, his disciple saw him doing it again. And he was saying, what, what are you doing? The first time, I was not mindful. The second time, I was doing it mindfully. And, and, and Buddha was saying, that's all the whole story of mindfulness. Because becoming aware of your unconscious reactions, but not, not, not changing it, not trying to tamper with it. Yes. And so what I would say is that seems like a tremendous waste of energy when, <laughs> when indiscriminately used.
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let's say I could snap my fingers and Raj would have perfect access to his non-conscious mind. That would almost certainly be certainly be incredibly overwhelming to you, right? And not particularly beneficial, right? <laughs> we so clear that that would be good for you if you don't if you don't want to change anything about it. You just want to observe it. This is like academic versus applied science. It's cool that you now like can see all of your non-conscious mind, but that's a tremendous waste of resources and cognitive resources, are precious, mm-hmm. right? And so, m- meditating for the pure for the for the pure purpose of knowing my unconscious mind seems to me to be a waste of time i have better things to do well, meditating meditating in order to gain access to a non-conscious part of my mind so that i can change something about it that is undesirable mm-hmm. to me mm-hmm, seems mm-hmm. extraordinarily worthwhile so what's useful and what's not useful yeah mm. more awareness to me does not seem very useful Cool. Uh, where is the future of behavioral science going to? Of applied behavioral science? Um, I mean, right now, I think what you're seeing is a shift from isolated applied behavioral science units mm-hmm. to behavioral, behavioral science as a process that is accessible to a larger number of people. So again, I brought up the analogy before of, of, of data science, mm-hmm. right? You used to have this little tiny discrete data science team and no one else used data. It's just this tiny team. And then we said, no, let's democratize the data. Like, let's make it so that Raj can use Tableau and he can have access to data too. And he doesn't have to be gated by this t- team of experts and this team of knowledge. Same thing's happening in applied behavioral science. Can we democratize these processes such that Raj and my eight-year-old can have a basic understanding of how behavioral science operates in the world such that they can use it as a tool. Are they going to be as good at it as the experts? Of course not. In the same way that I'm never going to be as good at data as somebody who spends all of their time on data. But if we can add it to people's toolbox of things that they can use horizontally, there is a lot of gain to be used there. So I would say, you know, one thread of behavioral science is, is you might be thinking of deep deepening behavioral science. So experts are getting more expert at it, but the other is broadening it, right? Making sure that more people have democratic access to it, which is where I spend the majority of my time is sort of how do we give democratic access to applied behavioral science. There are people who are looking very deeply in the discipline of applied behavioral science to find new things there. Many of them live in academia. It reminds me uh, of me reading something from your website of you mentioning the same concept of going deep and broad. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. We, we talk about this is not unique to me, right? There's this notion of T-shaped people, right? Mm-hmm. Having deep areas of, of vertical expertise and then horizontal, broad interests. I always told my team, you know, your legs keep you grounded, your arms help you fly, mm-hmm. right? So it's important to have a deep area of expertise. Absolutely. I mean, I think that that is key to success in life and in the job marketplace and in the world, right? But it kind of goes back to our earlier conversation about individualism versus mutualism. Having deep expertise can can be very powerfully individualistic, but if you can't find a way to work, to bridge sideways, to grab the hands of the people next to you and pull them closer, right? And to collaborate, then what good is it, right? You need that connective tissue, that mutualism. And so I think people need to be working on both. And so I spend the majority of my time on that sort of mutualism piece. How do we take people who are deep vertical expertise and, and use them collaboratively to get us to a place of enhanced impact? Mm. Okay. What are your favorite books? If you were to give a behavioral scientist or, or someone who's stepping into behavior science or your, your favorite book, let me take that. I mean, so this, these are very different answers because I, uh, for the past probably 15 years or so, at least 10 years, have explicitly read only fiction. Mm-hmm. So I still read journal articles and I still read a handful of things that people, you know, I'm reviewing a book or something. Somebody asked me to read something, but By and large, in my personal life, I read fiction. And the reason for that is most books can, and I include my own in this, right? Most nonfiction books can be summarized, can be improved through summarization or adjusted through summarization, right? So I can summarize Matt's book to Raj and and he'll get something of the flavor of the book in a positive way that he then could go deeper on, right? They can be upsized and downsized appropriately. To me, fiction, art, is that which can, which is reduced through summarization, meaning Uh, if I take a book like For Whom the Bell Tolls by Hemingway, yeah, I could give you a plot summary in a Wikipedia sort of way, but it would make the book considerably lesser than what it is. So the process of art is about getting things distilled to to a point at which distilling them further would create meaningful loss, 
right? It's finding that optimality of expression to where it cannot be diminished through, you know, where you cannot summarize. Um, and so I like fiction for that. I mean, I think it helps me. You can co explain to me and have many times during this podcast interview explain to me things that you've seen, articles you've experienced, truth that you've experienced, and you can communicate those to me. And that's great. And I love that. You can't summarize a book to me, right? You can't summarize a piece of fiction to me in the same way. And so that's where, when I spend my time, I want to spend my time on the stuff that nobody else can give me, right? And fiction is that thing that nobody else can give yeah, me. It was, it was, it was surprising you told me, like, you've read only fiction. Yeah, I, 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 I think that that's the place. Again, it's like boxing. If I'm going to spend time, I'm going to spend it in a place where I can get something that nobody else can give me, mm. right? So to your point earlier, you know, you said, well, we self-present to ourselves on personality surveys. Really, the best way to understand a personality is to talk to people around us. Mm -hmm. I sort of feel that way about nonfiction books, right? <laughs> and so I want to reserve my time, whether it's boxing or reading or whatever, for the things that only I uniquely can do for myself, hmm. right? And I can't get from other people. Uh, what are some heuristics a common person can apply from behavioral science? <laughs> Ooh, how many heuristics that a person can apply? For? I mean, we just talked about. So first of all, in applied behavioral science, we yeah. wouldn't tell you anything mm -hmm. because we believe each, you know, each situation is unique, right? So I then try to understand the laws about humans generally. We try and understand situational behavior change. But that having been said, um, you know, I think the mental model of we we don't have access to change behavior directly. Mm -hmm. Behavior is influenced by pressure and there are promoting pressures, things that make a behavior more likely when strengthened and inhibiting pressures, things that make behavior less likely when strengthened. I think that's a really useful tool that, you know, you can explain to an eight-year-old or the janitor or whoever that they can use. They can pick up and use as a tool. Hey, there's mm -hmm. a difference between promoting and inhibiting pressures. And if I'm explicit about what those are, then I then can change them to cause behavior to change. Because in reality, we don't change behavior. It's all mm -hmm. lies. Mm -hmm. I can't change your behavior. I can't pop in your brain and find the like, watch Netflix button and hit it. And then you watch Netflix, right? Instead, I increase promoting pressures and reduce inhibiting pressures to make that behavior probabilistically more likely. And so behavior, you know, pressures are the intervention space around which behavior occurs. Um, and so I think starting to look at your own and other people's behavior in that way is help. We use an acronym, you know, side strategy insights, design evaluation. Strategy is just who will be doing what when you're successful, right? We don't start at the end enough, right? We need to say, what does good look like, right? Not from where we are today, but from when we ended an optimal. Then we need to say, well, why, is to, why aren't we there, right? And why is that attractive? Promoting pressures, why would we want to live in that future world? And inhibiting pressures, why aren't we already there? There must be something pushing back against it if it's so attractive. Mm -hmm. Can I figure out what those are? Can I understand those things? then we can start to make changes to those things. And we can do that through experimentation, right? So strategy is telling us where we want to go. And the sites are, why are we where we are? Design is, well, let's, what are the things that we, what are the universe of things we could do about it? And then evaluation is, and which one of those things seems to work, right? If we try five of this universe of things, you know, is it one and three? Is it two and four? Is it one, three and five? Like, you know, what things seem to work to actually create the outcomes that we want? And having that, that clarity of mind and that, process that you then can evolve upon, right? Being deliberate allows us to improve deliberately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, can we expand on that with an example? Let's say I, I want to read a book. You want to read more often. Yes. Right. So when Raj wants to, why do you want to read? To give more good? knowledge, to okay, understand so more. When Raj wants to understand more things in the universe, he will read more books as measured by the total number of pages that Raj reads in a year. Okay. We have some measurement. On this. So then you can start to look at your own. So the first thing is you already have variants in your own behavior. So let's do this together. Raj, tell me about when, when are you more likely to read? You read sometimes, but you're not reading all the time. You're not reading right this moment. When are you more likely to read? Do you read at night, in the morning, on weekends, during the day? Like, what's going on when you read? Probably when my mind is more calm. So I'd say in the morning or before I go to sleep. Got it. So at the beginning, bookends of your day, beginning of your day, end mm -hmm. of your day. Mm -hmm. And to you, there's some element of, 
of calmness to that. So if you had a very frenetic day, you're less likely to read than a day where you had a calm day. Definitely less likely. Less likely. So for you, it's not like, well, reading is relaxing. And so I want, so I'll tell you, for example, if I had a frenetic day, I'm actually more likely to read at the end of the day because I find mm -hmm. reading calming. Okay. And so I'm actually more likely to do it because one of the promoting pressures is washing out the day, reaching a moment of Zen, getting rid of some of this other stuff and reading allows me to do that. Mm. You're saying no, in my behaviors I actually read less on stressful days. So that's what insights is. It's just, a, you know, observing yourself about when do I already do this and not do this? Mm -hmm. And we actually don't do that very much, right? So we say, I want to work out more, but we don't say, well, when am I working out and why do I do it on some days and not other days? And what's the difference between those days and how do I investigate that? So the lens of promoting pressure, why do I do that in the first place and inhibiting the pressure? When do I not do that? Right. And so you could start to say, well, okay, I don't, on, I don't do it on stressful days because I have less time or my brain's too busy and I, I'm fidgety and I can't get to that place of Zenness that I need. Right. You also could say, well, even on calm days, I'm much more likely to read if the book is interesting. Okay. Well, what makes a book interesting? Oh, I really like, you know, I picked up this book on the science fiction book and it took me forever to read it. I just didn't want to pick it up. It wasn't doing it for me. Right. But then I picked up this Matt Wallert book and I really liked it. And here's what I liked. Oh, he was very irreverent. Okay, great. Now you know that a promoting pressure might be irreverent and you can seek that out. You can say, okay, cool. One way to get myself to read more often is to seek out authors who are kind of iconoclastic, who are a little more irreverent, who have this kind of language. You could look at, you know what? If a book is 600 pages, I really struggle to get through it because every time I look at it, it doesn't feel like I'm making progress. The 300 page book, man, I, I clip right through. Maybe you should read more 300 page books, right? So there are, we can observe our own behaviors to then intervene. And then you got to try it, right? You got to run an evaluation. Hey, I think it's about book length. I think book length is a key pressure. Cool. I'm going to try consciously picking a shorter book next time and I'm going to see if it makes a difference or not. You know, I'm still struggling to read it. Maybe book length isn't as important as I want, right? Or as I thought. And so I'm going to go do something different. So it's like journaling with your behaviors. Yeah, you can do behavioral journaling, but it's not just observing your behaviors. You have to cross that boundary to like, and why? Why does this occur? Why is this happening? What can I do about it? How do I intervene? And then you got to try something, right? It's not sufficient to simply say like, okay, well, like, I think this is true. Good luck. I got to try it. I got to try reading a shorter book and see if it makes a difference. And if it doesn't make a difference, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I didn't observe that correctly. Maybe I need to try again. Maybe I need to look at it differently. Cool, cool, cool. I had a, a philosopher on my show and he gave me this tip of um, philosophical journaling. And he's, he was more into stoicism and all those stuff. And um, he gave me the exact uh, exact thing. He was like, when you are journaling, you must ask, what did I do wrong today? What could I improve? Uh, where did I lose control? So when you ask more of these analytical questions to yourself, that's when you are actually getting, quote unquote, useful. Mm -hmm. And that's, so this is where I agree that frameworks help, right? It's not just why did I do the thing? It's well, what are all the things that make that more likely? What are all the things that make that less likely? Mm -hmm. We often locate the locus of control in ourselves, right? So there's what let me call the actor observer bias, mm -hmm. which is when we are observing other, when we're observing ourselves, right? If, if we're doing a good thing, we often think it's about us. So if I help Raj, it's because I'm a good person. And if I'm late for the train, well, it's because there were all these barriers in my way this morning. So when I do something bad, it's because of my environment. When I do something good, it's because of me. When I evaluate Raj, when Raj helps Matt, it's because, well, Raj wants to look good in front of other people. Right. It's about his environment. It's not about him. It's about his environment. Right. And when Raj does something bad, it's because he's a bad person. Oh. And so what behavioral science tries to help us do is remove that filter and say, rather than thinking about anything about you, say what in my you are constant. Right. And in our book reading example, on some days you read, on some days you don't, you are the constant. So we don't have to think about you. We can look at your environment and we can say structurally, what are the promoting and inhibiting pressures that cause this thing to be true, mm. not true on the difference? Because clearly it's not you, it's the days. Something about the days is different. Figure that out. Right. Because you are the constant. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, Matt, we've gone way past the, t uh, the time I just stood from you. Right there. <laughs> Uh, thank you for being here and uh, spending the time. I'm, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, what are your works now and where can people find you and what, you, what are you up to? 
Well, I'm luckily that I have a very unique name, so <laughs> you can find me everywhere online. Uh, I'm working uh, on a broadly what has turned into sort of a second book, mm -hmm. although I'm not publishing it. We're just putting it out literally as like a Google Doc that people can read. Um, specifically, you know, if the first book was about how to do applied behavioral science, the second book is very much about how do you do it in organizations. So meaning who's on the team, where does it sit in the organization? How does it work across the organization? What is the methodology within those, you know, how do people have accountability within that team, et cetera. Um, so I'm almost finished with that. Um, it's very easy to find me online, mattwaller.com, right? You can read the book, start at the end. Um, you know, we, we teach classes, you know, learn applied bsci.com and, you know, we have uh, applied bsci.com, which is a great short presentation about all the things that we talked about today. Um, and then, you know, BSI, applied bsci teams, which is this new guide that we're putting out and should be done soon. It's already up and people can start to read it, but it's not quite finished. Um, work in progress. <laughs> they may stay at work in progress because I continue to learn. Well, that was Matt sharing his views on the Seekers Mind Talks. I hope all of you guys enjoyed the show. And if you did, please don't forget to show us your support. And do check out our other videos as well. Until next time, this is your host Raj signing off from the Seekers Mind Talks.